Welcome to Necromaniacs, episode 23. Thank you very much for tuning in with us this evening, and I hope everyone had a great summer. Mike, we are, summer? Uh, yes, I, I had a pretty good summer. It was pretty good. Uh, started out kind of slow, you know, didn't do too much, but it ended well. Busy with band stuff and, and other things, you know, extracurricular activities, which is always nice. Um, but yeah, it was good. I mean, I just, I felt like it was gone in the blink of an eye, just like they always are, aren't they, Mike? I agree with that. Now that we're adult men and uh, <laughs> the days of our youth when summer seemed to last, as like the Brian Adams song once stated, mm-hmm. summer lasts forever. Forever, yes. <laughs> no, those, they do not. No, no, not anymore. Now that we're, you know, dealing with the uh, disappointments of adult life <laughs> and the, the rigors of uh, adulthood. Of adulting, yeah, yeah. Serious adulting. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, like I just, I don't know. I feel like we uh, we did like the June or May, June one two minutes ago, and here we are doing a September one, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Time, but, definitely uh, flew. time marches on, and so do we. And I just want to say real quick, uh, you know, a hello, and uh, we're thinking about you to everybody in, in Florida and in Texas who might be listening with these uh, god-awful hurricanes. I have uh, two brothers in Florida who are still without power, actually, and... Uh, it's day three, and one of my brothers has two young children and, and like, a, a two-year-old. So, I mean, it's it's pretty bad situation down there. All things considered, they're, they're okay. They're, their homes are okay. But uh, I know there are people with f- way more damage in, in both Texas and in Florida. So uh, just wanted to say a hello and, you know, hang in there. Yeah, I got a bunch of friends down there. One of them is a mutual friend of ours, actually, Brian Shank and Alex. Yes, that's yeah. right. And mm-hmm. they seem to be hanging in there okay. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I, I don't know, going three days in the 90-degree weather without power has got to really suck. That's got to suck. Um, it's not losing your home suck, but as days pass and there's still no electricity and you can't, you know, do what you got to do and eat a normal meal and... You know what I'm saying? Turn on your lights. That, that's probably make you crazy. Definitely. But, uh, you know, back to uh, the maniacs of the day or of the night. It's almost night as we do this. If it was winter, it would be night right it now. It would be night right now. But that's it's true. Like twilight. You know, this yeah. Point of the day. The days are getting shorter. Yep. So uh, for this episode, we've been threatening to cover cruising. <laughs> Since I think it, episode one, possibly yeah, it's possibly for three full years. Yeah, so yes. now now we're going to actually cover cruising. Yes, and um, also and also we're going to hit uh, the Devil's Candy and a film that not a lot of people saw called A Dark Song. Yeah, it's on uh, it's on Netflix right now, and Devil's Candy's been on Netflix for a while. Apparently, you know, yeah. it's, a lot of people have seen it and it, it's uh, doing well on there. So. Uh, yeah, we're going to kick this one off with Cruising because uh, it, it's a film Mike and I both really in, enjoyed, enjoy, and uh, have seen several times. And like he said, we've referenced it a bunch because, I mean, there's just, you know, the, the stars in it, the, the, the director, et cetera, the time period. There's just a lot of things about it that appeal to Mike and I and appeal to kind of the theme of this podcast. Would you agree? Absolutely. You know, I think there have been many points of this podcast where we, we, we have referred to cruising as an American giallo. Totally. A gay American giallo. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, absolutely. And I it think has, that's accurate, right? It has a lot of the tenets, you know, uh, of the giallo film, it being, you know, a thriller and a lot of the kind of, you know, you're not really sure what the hell's going on until the very end kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are, there are other, you know, Knives. pieces of that puzzle, too, you know? You know a knife and a black-gloved hand. Knife, black... Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot of great stuff you could, you know, tie in uh, with the giallo to it. The use of music, uh, the use of sex, uh, sexuality. It's just, you know... It's, I mean, I think you'd be crazy not to think it, it, would, it could fit into that category. I agree. Yes. But before we hit that, I think uh, we have to say a couple words about the wrap-up of Twin Peaks. Mm, yes. Which was a big topic this summer oh my god everyone was talking about twin peaks including myself including mike both longtime fans of the tv series and of uh david lynch as a director yeah so um so yeah the, the, you know recently it wrapped up and what what were your thoughts on that okay i i loved what well, episode episode 17 actually 
16 when Cooper comes back, because we haven't talked since 16, 17, yeah. or 18, right? Uh -huh. That episode 16 was just like what everyone wanted. I absolutely loved it. I actually loved how Cooper came back. Every like I just it couldn't have been better, I thought. It was almost like reminiscent of, of something that would have been in season one. Like like you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that kind of like, you know, care and quality. Absolutely. And and you know what I'm saying? Like I was just so jazzed up for the following week that it was almost like, well, how what's gonna be better than this episode, right? Well that that's what I think, like why this last this third season seems so weird and off was that you did not have dale cooper present no except for maybe in the very beginning you did when he was in the black lodge mm -hmm. and then there was like some flashbacks here and there right. but you didn't have him as the main character he was not driving the series yeah. he was not you know driving the car so to speak but in a way you could say he kind of was or at least you could say kyle mclaughlin was because yeah. of all the roles he had to play. And in a way, it kind of, it, it was his show, in a way, still. Yeah. In, in a weird way. But, you know, but he was playing virtually three different roles, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I imagine that's really hard to do. He was playing the anti-Cooper, mm -hmm. you know, with the mullet and the leather jacket and the black eyes. Yep. He was playing Dougie, mm -hmm. which is, got, I, I got to be completely honest with you, man. It got old. <laughs> it got, yeah. It was it making us nuts. I, we were talking about it. It was making me crazy. It was making us pretty crazy. Yeah. And, uh. I would like to have had, and there was a point where we thought this is going to be it, man. There's no coup. Yeah, we thought there'd be no comeback at all. Yeah, yeah he was just going to be existing out there in, <laughs> in Nevada with Oof. Naomi Watts as like a big f you to everybody. Yeah, he's not coming back. Right, and then he came back as the the, the <laughs> Dale Cooper that we knew. Yeah, or no, as but a little, definitely like a little darker character though. Yes, um, in episode seventeen. When everyone is at the police station, which was like the best fucking part mm -hmm. for me, I was just bugging the fuck out at the tension of what was going to happen. Because Evil Coop is sitting down talking to the, uh, the sheriff, and yeah. like, you know, like, and uh, the real Cooper's on his way, and it's like, holy shit, Big what is going to happen? Right. Yeah. And the, uh, the uh, what's the glove guy's name in the prison? I can't think of it. Oh, the name. Irish dude? Yes, he's downstairs. Yeah. And it's like, okay, everything's culminating. That was great. I, I really thought that was really great. Um, some people complained about the hokiness of the destruction of Evil Coop, like yeah. punching a basketball, but whatever. I mean, I, I didn't mind that so much. Uh, I mean... It, David Lynch isn't known for his big battle fight no. scenes. I mean, it's like it's not going to be some choreographed like fight scene. It's, no, no. And also, it's like part of like what you got to do with David Lynch is open your mind up to all kinds of shit that you're not going to expect to see. Right. You're not. You're not getting normalcy almost anywhere. No. You it's know. it's a it's very much of the f fantastic in a way, you know. And if if not that, it's just it's it's its own reality. It's its own fucking definitely thing. its own reality. Its own shit. So it doesn't really compare to anything else in a way. Yeah. Um, but it was just so, like, uh, palatable, the change. Once, like, the evil Cooper was destroyed and just everything, like, you could just, and, like, Cooper himself didn't, kind of, like, everything just changed right there. And I was like, uh-oh, something is still not, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's, it's not over. Like, the no. evil is there. Like, yeah. they're just, they're still, you know what I'm saying? Uh, just because you destroyed the evil coop doesn't mean it, anything is, is over. And I thought they did a good job of that, like about oh, how yeah. just the kind of like, like the fade-ins of like of the the Black Lodge and just like all the the, the other trippy stuff that was going on. And Coop's face kind of like changed, his face and eyes kind of changing, and just like oh shit, wait a minute, like is evil coop still here? Like it was like remember that? Yeah, like no, definitely. I thought that was a really cool yeah. part. But then it just. It, as it kind of uh, spun into the next episode, the thing with like him and Diane, it definitely got it got extra Lynch. Yes. Where it it started to kind of lose me, you know, and I just kind of rolled with it anyway. Like I didn't know, okay, w what version do we have here? What is happening right now? What reality are we in right now? That's when it got a little weird. For well, me. yeah, it's like it's almost like in Mulholland Drive, mm. where you know you got these characters. And then suddenly they're in like a different re different version of that reality, yep. and and I think that David Lynch like um, is very much into like the concept of like a multiverse and and all this oh, like, totally, uh, totally, yeah. altered 
altered realities and everything. And now, now speaking to that, do you, jumping ahead a little there with that, do you think Cooper kind of fucked things up with Laura when he went back to that scene in uh, Firewalk with me? That get in, like uh, where she's like in the woods or whatever, like that, like, where he like he 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 finds her and he like. Yeah. That's what that's like one theory uh-huh. about how he him doing that brought them into that reality they were at the very end of the last episode where she's not even Laura Palmer he's not even Dale Cooper you know what I'm saying like all these kind well, of weird things a couple of ideas like I'm not my that's a good point that you mm. bring up about him going back into time and altering history mm. and then everything changing but what I was thinking is what happens is like when he was driving through the desert with Diane mm-hmm. they hit like a certain mile marker yes and that was like delineating some changeover that's where the change began. Yeah. You're right, you're right. And then you're he right. goes into the hotel room and he bangs her out. And then, like, uh, in the morning, there's a fucking note with, it's, like, different things. Things were really changed, on. right. They, they was, like, if things hadn't just a little bit changed when they crossed over it, while driving, that next morning, things had very much changed. Yeah. Because he actually is now some kind of hybrid of old Cooper, new Cooper, right? Yeah, yeah. He, was, he, he, could, he wasn't either anymore. Yeah, because right. he also commented about Sonny Jim... And how he's like, I'm always going to be your dad or something like that. Mm, or he was like, mm. like the, maybe like there are certain characteristics of Dougie that remained inside of him. Yes. And like he was all, but then he melded with his own former self. Mm. You know, and that's what I mean. It's like very much like this, um, you know, there's that theory about infinity where there's like an infinite number of every possible situation, including this exact situation. They say that on Rick and Morty. The yeah. cartoon. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes. So every there's an possible, infinite number of Rick and Morty's. Yeah, so every, mm. into infinity. So there's like, yeah. a, you know, a possibility that there is like some clashing or melding of these two different reality mm. tracks. Yeah. And somehow he crossed those streams and became like a, a, a hybrid of both of them. Now, at the, the very end, when they get to the house, yeah. and it's not even the, 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 uh, the Palmer house anymore. Uh-huh. Or it um, never was. What did you? Yeah, like what? But I'm, I, what I got out of that was where they were in that time. It it never like it never was, or or like it was it was Judy kind of fucking with them, making them. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't know. Like the whole, there's the whole Judy thing. Like uh, her kind of really setting all this in motion, you know what I'm saying? Like how she's really the ultimate evil behind this whole entire thing. Uh-huh. And that they'd been talking about her and been warned about her and that that presence had been there like like that she's maybe the reason why that woman answered the door who actually is the the owner of the house in real life actually. It's pretty that was kind of well, cool. The that. thing I was thinking about and I thought it took a, a while to figure to think about it after I watched that episode and I was like, okay, obviously Cooper's in a different reality. Because we find yes. some, some like chick living in like some methed out version of Laura Palmer as an adult mm-hmm. living in some with a dead body. It's like yeah, yeah, dead body in the living but room. Somebody was saying no, that's Laura. No, Laura knows that it's Laura, but she's playing off that it isn't. I'm gonna say it's what? not Laura. I'm gonna say that Laura guy, the Laura Palmer that is, we know died is dead in a different reality because mm. when Cooper changed over at that he hit that mile marker. He somehow they went somewhere else to a different mm. track in reality. Now, and, and in this reality, there's no Laura Palmer, but there's this lady, whatever her name was. Yeah, I can't think of her right now. Living her life in you know Texas or mm-hmm. the Odessa, that up. Odessa, uh-huh. and then a lovely town, by the way. Uh-huh. And then, and then, they travel back to Twin Peaks. What we we're talking about? Oh, no, actually, no, it's not Twin Peaks. But that's right. They, it's it's Odessa. That's what or something like. No, it's, no, no. When they go back to the house, oh, right, the Laura right, Palmer right, house. Okay. Now that. Like I was saying about infinite versions of reality, that house exists. Mm. However, the family doesn't exist. But what about like the last part? And that's I was thinking about. Okay. This. Now, when Cooper is like the bridge between this reality and the reality where Laura Palmer existed, I would say that. And the echoes of that, because she that that lady had no idea what the fuck was going on. She All was right. like, "Who is this people?" You know, like mm. the Laura Palmer, quote unquote, woman. But Cooper sort of allowed some resonance 
or echo from that other reality. And that's why you heard that voice. Mm. And the lady from that reality caught a glimpse of what actually transpired in that location. In a you think that's reality. what that was? It wasn't her remembering? No. At that or if it was a memory, it was like some like reincarnation memory or some like you right. know, other other like like past lives type thing, maybe. And one know? opinion was that like that was Laura and that she was so PTSD'd that she has this whole other life and that she's kind of a mess and that but I know, that was Laura? that's like a whole huge that's a big that's leap. a huge leap. That's, that's a big leap. As much I as we're talking about alternate realities yeah. and like infinity. I think there's at least some kernel of logic in what I'm saying. Yeah, least. exactly. Even if you make that decision <laughs> to follow that track, rather than like a woman who almost had her head cut off. So she when she, thrown in when he's, when river. Cooper says, "What year is this?" Yeah. What do you think he means? Like, actually, what year is this, or does he mean like, kind of in like a haze, like like what you know? Like, I think that he's realizing that he's somewhere else, mm, and mm. this is like some other. He's a man from a different world in mm. another in, in a world that he doesn't really belong in. Right. And in that reality, there's probably another yet another version of him walking around too. Now, are you That's happy not Dale Cooper. if there's no revisiting of, of Twin Peaks whatsoever? Do you like this as the ending? I, I, where Cooper, where there, where Laura and Cooper are kind of like trapped. Yeah, I, 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 um, and I could watch. I, I would love for them to make more episodes and more seasons and of Twin do Peaks. and do maybe flesh that out a little more maybe this well, whole idea but um but maybe not you know what the same way every other David David Lynch film <laughs> ends where you watch you see, watch the end of the Lost Highway you watch the end of Mulholland Drive mm. and it just that's the end that's the way it ends then another theory was that it was kind of went with what you said but then it but but it ultimately it was like well uh, real Cooper and real Laura are in the lodge forever. That's where they are. And that's why it ends with them in the lodge. That's where they, that's where they are. Like, that's where they okay. are even after, what, once the police station scene okay. cleans up, that's where they, that's where they go. Really? Okay. Yeah, that's something I read. I mean, I read yeah, so that's much. That's interesting. That still, that, that whole expanded world is actually in the Black Lodge. Mm. There's really nothing to indicate that, but yeah, I mean, sure. That, that I mean, work. The thing is, she was murdered. Like, why? Why do well, they? That, why are people? Why does she her? need to be alive? She's like, dead. yeah, she's dead. Like, I don't know, fucking, like, you know what I'm saying. They like, cut, he cut her up, man. She was dead. Yeah, her being dead means a lot to the oh, show. Yeah. Totally. Why does they? Why does she have to be alive? No, she doesn't she's, be alive. Laura Palmer in that in that reality in that strand of reality is is dead and gone. Hmm. And there's nothing. You know, 25 years. And also, she is that Laura Palmer. He left her in the fucking Black Lodge. <laughs> so she's not anywhere except for there. Yeah. So it's like, why would there be... But she said, I'll see you again in 25 years. Yeah. The, but the Laura Palmer that said that, though, was the... Was, was the war, was Laura the, Palmer. Yeah. Yeah, because when she got murdered, she ended up in the Black Lodge. Mm. Like her essence or whatever, you know right, what I mean? Her right. spirit. <laughs> so I, I'm. am I happy... Uh, no, but that's the that's the that's ending just, David Lynch that's gave. It. Me. That's, that's it. Gotta, that's it. It's you, just you buy uh, that ticket. Yep. You know, you know what you're in for when you yeah. watch one of his fucking movies or any of his projects. It's like <laughs> it's going to be weird. It's going to be something that you have to really think about, and some of it still might not never make sense to you. No, it may never make sense. No. You know. Now, furthermore, there's like tons of storylines that were never even they were started and never resolved and never addressed. But fucking, that's what life is, Jack. Mm -hmm. It's like sometimes like. Fucking, there's all these parallel stories going on around us in life, and that's they never get resolved, man. Or, or you don't find out about what the resolution is. True. You know, there is so much shit that I would love to have seen, but we just didn't get to it. So the, I would say the general consensus between the two of us is that we did like it. I mean, there's it, things we didn't like, but we liked it, and that we're okay with the way it ended. I would say I'm okay with it. Yeah. I'm not, I, mean, I didn't hate it. I didn't, like, hate it. No. I don't, I don't feel that's like... That's a strong word. I feel like I got what... I signed up for. Right. Like, I didn't think that everything was going to end all, like, you know, like, clear. And I knew it was going to be, like, a lot of just, like, trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. And, like, mm. you know, it wasn't going to be this nice, nice, neat ending where Dale Cooper ends up back in the in the FBI. And, like, you know what I mean? Like, my only other beef is the throwaway of Audrey Horn. They just, yeah. it was really... Well, that's what I was saying. That was underwhelming. Yeah. That was very underwhelming. I mean, they, people, I mean, would have been nice if they did a little little more with that. 
and it, but you know what are you gonna do? Well, yeah, there's all sorts of things, and and you know, um, their son that he yeah. has mm-hmm. like that storyline. There's like a lots of of other things that just have their storylines just ended. Or the I just think that getting. she she was in a coma and woke up from the coma, and that's what that was. That that scene, her last scene. That's what I think it was. Okay. Other than that, I have no clue. That's my own. That, that's <laughs> I have no idea. Like, um, if if say the whole season was her dream, I don't buy that no, one. That that's a cop. I just think her shit. scenes might have been her dream. Her scenes, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? There's no because way. they shouldn't interact with anybody else. No. So except for the, her creepy husband. There's no way that a piece of ass like Audrey, Audrey Horn, little Audrey Horn, right, would have gone with that with guy. And it made no sense at all. Like that it made guy. no sense. Not even as an older woman. No. No. No way. Hell no. So I think that portion was the was was her dream. And and that she did wake up. So she actually got somewhat of a happy ending in a way. That's yeah. my little take. Sure. But uh yeah, Twin Peaks, man. What are you gonna do? <laughs> I mean I'm stoked. I'm, I'm glad. It was a yeah, summertime. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm thing, gonna I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna looking forward to buying the uh the LP, which is uh, I think oh, comes yeah. out next week or something. Yep. Yeah. The music is sensational. Oh, it was really good. I mean I couldn't ask for better music. But, uh, yes, we're going to be moving along to uh, cruising now. I mean, I don't want to take for granted that everyone's seen this movie who's listening because I have a good feeling that quite a few have not seen the movie. Um, because it's actually it's, yeah. it's unavailable again. Uh, there was a DVD that came out in 2007. And it was, you, you and know. both have. Yeah, we both have it. And I believe it's been out of print for over five to seven years uh, now, so which kind of sucks. It came out on Region One and Region Two, but it's a 1980 American crime film directed by William Fried, written and directed by William Friedkin, of course, the director of my number two horror film of all time, The Exorcist. Um, and it stars Al Pacino, uh, Paul Sorvino from uh, Goodfellas, who many know, Big Paulie, uh, and Karen Allen from many uh, a film in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, probably. One of her biggest roles is uh, Scrooge, I would say, and she's also in Animal House. I mean, so I don't remember her in Animal House. Oh, wait, is she? Wait, I believe she's in Animal okay. House, isn't she? Well, anyway, um, based we, on the book of the we, same we're name. We're leaving out one important guy. Yeah. Oh, yes, I am leaving out one. Joe Spinell. Joe. Well, yes, Joe. I'm. Mean, I was going oh, okay, to get to the, sorry. I didn't mean to the cut familiar you off. faces in it. All right, familiar faces. But um, it, it does also star, uh, Joe Spinell has a smaller role in it, playing a very sleazy, disgusting cop who kind of <laughs> kicks off the movie. And uh, it also stars Richard Cox and Don Scardino. Um, it is based on a book that had come out in like 1970 with the same name by uh, Gerald Walker, which is a really controversial book that kind of, um, well, I guess it was sadly of its time. It had a very negative portrayal of of the gay community because it's a it's a murder mystery that takes place in the gay community um and this this movie uh takes place in the summertime in new york city these body parts start showing up uh in the hudson river and the police uh, expected to be the work of a, of a homosexual uh serial killer in the village who frequents bars um and and you know just kills these men who, you know, a lot of the cops kind of feel are kind of disposable. You kind of get this attitude. They're like, oh, the paperwork and blah, blah, yeah. blah. It just kind of shows a general... Yeah. Uh, it's like the age-old, you know, New York City cop, late 70s. Yes, like, early know, 80s, vibe. kind of like sleazy, yeah. don't give a fuck attitude. Only people with money, you know, right. are the ones they care about. Exactly. So uh, we learn um, that Officer Steve Burns, Al Pacino... Uh, has been uh, summoned by the, the the police chief, which is uh, played by Paul Sorvino, to uh, you know come into his office, and he wants to tell him about you know you know about all these uh, body parts that have been showing up, these unsolved murders that have been happening, and he asks him if he would like to go undercover, and he's like sure, but before he actually asks them that, he asks them if he's ever had sex with men, yeah. <laughs> and he asks a very series of very graphic questions, um, to which Al Pacino replies, uh, no, no. So 
but he agreed. But since he's like a, a, a younger cop, the funny thing is he's supposed to be in his late twenties, and Al Pacino was like thirty six at the time yeah, of this yeah, movie, definitely. and he does not look like a man in his late twenties. No. So I thought that was kind of funny. They do that. They used to do that all the time, man. Oh like yeah, back get, in the like, day, some guys like forty you're supposed to play a twenty two year old. Totally, totally. Oh, I just want to throw the Joe Spinell in there. The very opening of the movie, it's Joe Spinell and another uh, policeman uh, in a cop car, kind of cruising the streets of uh, the meatpacking district, which. Back in the 70s and 80s was uh, more of a gay uh, area. Um, and they're just like, you know, they, they pulled two uh, uh, transvestites. Uh, well, t- uh, tranny two transvestites. Right, yeah. exactly. I'm sorry um, for the uh Right, because I don't word. think they're they're not uh, transgender. I believe they're, they're you know. cross-dressers. Cross-dressing, cross-dressing. exactly. <laughs> cross-dressing prostitutes, right. Yeah. It's 1979, 1980. And... Um, they get them in the car. They make them do like it, it. It's unseen on camera, but they make them, you know, do sexual favors for them. It's just like a really gross scene, and that's kind of kick, kicks off the kind of vibe of the movie. Um, but yeah, as I said, uh, Detective Burns Al Pacino agrees uh, to go on this assignment because you know he's it, it's it's like an exciting assignment for him or whatever. And also, this is the kind of thing where it's like you know, you, back in the day, you always hear these stories about like you know. After doing like a an assignment like this, you be you get you get a promotion, up, you get promoted, right? Exactly, more money. And Paulie says, "How would you like to disappear?" That's what he says to Al Pacino in the movie. And Al Pacino's like, "Sure." Um, but the thing is, you know, uh, all, these murders have all been unsolved. They they can't get a handle on them, which, like I said, is partially for not giving a fuck because of of who they are, and the, the other reason is just, I mean, they're so grisly, you know. They don't, and it's. I guess the, the the era of what the murders take place in, they don't have the the, the technological advances. No, yeah. the forensic. No, they don't. All they have is fingerprints. Like they mentioned fingerprints a few times, right? There's no like you know major DNA scans going on just yet. Um, but this movie actually, uh, at the time uh, they were making it, it was very controversial. It was filmed in the summer of '79, and the word had gotten out uh, to the gay community. Because they knew about the book, they hated the book, and they knew the movie was being made, so they there was major disruptions, like actual demonstrations. Yes, like yeah. uh, like making noise wherever they they would mm-hmm. find out where the the scenes were being shot, and they would make noise. They would tell the owners uh, of certain places where they knew it was going to be filmed that don't support this movie, don't let them in. It was like a whole big thing, and it went on throughout the entirety of the shooting of this movie. But they managed to get the movie done. It's it, yeah. they kind of go into more detail about this on the uh, DVD, and I think yeah, if you if you combed YouTube, that. you might be able to find some of these DVD extras on YouTube, probably because they're really good and they talk really in depth about this. But um, you know, the gay community back then was not what it is now uh, in the slightest, and this is even pre-AIDS. Yeah. Um, but there was. It's funny. You do learn. Uh, if you listen to the commentary on the DVD and you watch these featurette extras, that while there was maybe half of the gay community wanted no part of this movie and thought it was fucked up, the other half of the gay community was like thought it was great, and there was a lot of extras from this S and M scene in the movie that had no problem being in the movie and had no problem with the movie. So it was kind of like uh, it wasn't all naysaying, basically. Yeah. There was people that were fine with this movie in the you know in the gay community. Well, also yeah, back in the seventies, being gay in America in that particular point in history was way like you were saying way different than now. It's like mm. they just kind of there was no to, mainstream. There was yeah, no they, nor- normalization. Almost it was very different. Yeah, nowadays you can you people. I think your average person understands that there's all different types of. Uh, you know, little sub genres of yeah, being yeah. gay and little different quirks. So, but what the, the the beef was that this is what everyone in America is going to think being gay means. Like yeah. that was, and that was I legit, that. Yeah. legit beef. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they had a legit argument, yeah. and they're like, like they're all depraved, and we're all killers, and we're all like serial killer, like. I could, you know, I'd be fucking pissed too. You know what I'm saying? If I was a, a, a gay man in 1979 living in New York City and I knew about the book and I knew about the movie, I probably would have been protesting too. <laughs> yeah, because it's, um, I mean, all right, we, we can get into the unclarity actually. Right. Talking about a film where you don't know what the fuck's going on. Right. 
it's the first time I watched this way back in the 80s when I was mm-hmm. a kid. I thought I knew what was going on. Mm-hmm. But then as time went on and I watched it repeated times, I started mm-hmm. realizing that I had a lot of misconceptions about who was actually doing the murders. Yes, and we'll definitely get into that. Yeah. Um, now, the thing is, uh, Burns, uh, aside from just going on the cover, he gets like an apartment, like he gets a new name. Um, oh, what's the name? He goes by Forbes, something Forbes. Um, and uh, he meets a, a, a guy, uh, Ted Bailey, who, uh, who's like a struggling playwright who lives in the building with him. And it was a very interesting thing about all the scenes that feature the guy, uh, Ted Bailey. They're all in the daytime, and they're all shot very uh, bright. Yeah. Because he is, uh, you know, unfortunately, for better or worse, one of the only kind of uh, pictures of what, say, like, you would picture a, a gay man now would be. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, definitely. Or, like, what the people who were protesting were. You know what I'm saying? Like, that part of the gay community. Like... Just creative. like a, a guy who, ha- who was gay. Yeah. That's like, all. Who was creative. You know, guy. Even like his his job. You know, it's like he lives in like you know the the, the village. Vill- and uh-huh. It's like you know creative guy. Right. Like, he know, he writer. didn't go to leather bars. Yeah, he, he didn't go like, uh, cruising. Leather. Right. He even says yeah. that in the movie. And uh, the movie itself is is very dark. It's shot dark. Like the, I mean, it's in color, but it's it might as well be in black and white. It's it's a very kind of gritty looking movie. Uh, in a lot of the scenes in the movie. And that's just something you would notice if you, you watch it again or if you haven't seen it, um, about how there's only specific daytime scenes in this film. Um, but uh, he has a girlfriend, Al Pacino, played by Karen Allen. And um, he, you know, he, he tells her he's on a new assignment. She's like, well, what is it? And he's like, I can't talk to you about it. I can't tell you about it. And you just, I don't know, there's just the little weird vibes from Al Pacino. Um even when he's just kind of all he's done so far is just met the guy Ted. He hasn't even really gone out to the clubs yet. Uh, and then he finally, you know, decides to go out to the clubs, and he's just in for like this huge culture shock, and he's just kind of taking everything in all around you, all around him. And I mean, I'll say this: this movie does a very good job of throwing you into that world, to say the very least. Um, it is like it is very real and gritty, and uh, you know, I would imagine. I mean, uh, according to Freak and according to things I read, these were shot at real gay clubs. Yeah, that's what I This is too. what was going on at mm-hmm. the clubs. The extras were people who would go to the club. So it wasn't much make-believe going on. So and also that's you're, interesting. There, there's a, a allegedly or, or apparently there's like a 45-minute uh, cut the, of footage, footage right. that was cut that, out of that, like Yeah, extreme. Freak and spent a lot of time at these places to, to get – to do research and to get, you know, footage. And apparently he, some of the most graphic footage, it was about 40 minutes worth of it, is lost to time. Um, it was never included in any of the theatrical or home video cuts of the movie, but it was known out there that it was out there. And then when it came time for this 2007 DVD, they went to look for it just, and it was like gone. He's like, this this is gone. Wow. It's not at United Artists Vaults. They don't have it. He was like, United Artists probably destroyed it. That's what he said. So it is lost to time. And as, as a little sidebar to that, uh, actor James Franco, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, did, a, did this kind of short documentary called Interior Leather Bar, where he looked to recreate that lost, <laughs> lost 40 minutes. Uh, I have not seen it. Yeah, it's 2013. Uh, James Franco and Travis Matthews, uh, Interior Leather Bar, in which they appear as filmmakers working on a film which <laughs> attempts to reimagine and recreate the 40 minutes of deleted lost footage from cruising. I kind of want to see that in yeah. a way. I need to I I want to see it just because, you know. Um, also I like James Franco's work yeah, too, man. It's a docu fiction. It's like it's it's part documentary, part like fake movie kind of thing. Doubt it's called that. Interior Leather Bar. Only James Franco would want to do this. He's he's that's the thing about him. At least he's like a an adventurous kind of daring oh, actor. Dude, James Franco. He's up for anything. You got to give him it, man. that. I think he's doing great in, uh, in the Deuce too, man. Yes. Uh, the uh, HBO show. We'll great. talk a little bit about that yeah. uh, later. But um, the thing is, as, you, as you're watching Cruising and you're seeing the murders take place, the murders are very graphic. Yes, by the they way. are. Like horrific. Like yes. a horror movie style. That's also murders. how they they really kind of fall in line with the more sleazier 
of the Giallo films out there, yeah, actually. Yeah, definitely. Like some of the more brutal ones, like uh, Strip Nude for Your Killer uh, came to mind. Um, and some of like the later 70s, early 80s ones where they just they just kind of throw all the kind of suspense out the window and just go for more of like the, the slasher gore. Um, you never really get a good look at the face of the killer, quote unquote, except for that he has dark hair and possibly dark eyes, which is the reason why um, Al Pacino's character, Steve Burns, is chosen, because he fits the profile of what the killer likes. All the victims have dark hair and dark yeah. eyes. There's a lot of like weird things going on with like, the camera kind of fucks with you a lot in this movie, where you think you get a, a look at the killer's face, and it's like, no, wait a minute, it actually looks different from the killer yeah, in the other he's, scenes. He's wearing like, like you know? sunglasses, or it's a yeah, weird yeah. angle. And very creepily, the voice of the killer is done by an actor who is played by none of the actors who plays the killer. It's done by the guy who plays, uh, uh, who we think later on is the killer's dad. He does the voice. That guy in the park, there's that scene with, um, what do you call it, Richard Cox, who plays Stuart Richards, who we believe to be the killer in the movie. There's a scene where he's talking with his dad uh, in the park in the, in the village, and his dad has this really creep, creep voice, and that is the voice used throughout the movie any time the killer is talking. So that's kind of a cool move by Friedkin, too. He fucks with you throughout this movie. And if, you, if you've seen it and you're not realizing that now, you need to see it again about yeah, how the again. camera messes yeah. with you and how the audio kind of messes with you. And if you've never seen it, I, I think you're, you're in for quite a treat anyway. <laughs> you might be pretty shocked to, uh, you know, by the whole thing. One one of the most notable scenes is when, in my opinion, funny too. Mm. It's like when uh, when they they take uh, Al Pacino's character in. Like, yes, um, at one point, there's a, a suspect who I don't know. I having rewatched it the other night, I'm like, why did they even think this guy was the killer? The, uh, it's one of the characters who worked in a restaurant because all the killer's victims had this certain knife uh, stabbing. And they kind of traced the knife back to a certain uh, restaurant, and they found out where this, you know, this perpetrator worked. So they, they, you know, they kind of stake him out or whatever. And then him and Al Pacino uh, hook up in, in one of the bars one night, and they go to a motel. And the cops just kind of take it upon themselves to barge in on them when nothing has really happened yet. Yeah. There's like a messed up audio. And the guy they think is the killer, even he's going, oh, why, why do you want me to tie you up? Like, he's even like, he's not even acting all that, like, right. into it. But they burst it anyway, and they take him and Al Pacino in because they don't reveal that Al Pacino's a cop on the cover, of course. Yeah. And, again, more to disjoint and mess with the viewer, this big, tremendous black man clad in a hat, boots, and underwear just jock walks strap. in. Not a just jock underwear, strap, a jock Just strap. walks into the interrogation room and slaps Al Pacino in the face. It is the wildest thing ever. Now, there's like, a, we just read something recently, how that actually is not, even that is pretty accurate to the way the cops <laughs> used to interrogate people. Mm. Like, they would do these outlandish things like that. Wow. So when the, if like um, a, a complaint was filed, mm. that it would seem... <laughs> like completely like unbelievable. I also think it was just a means to get confessions. It was a means to get information, sure. right? Yeah. I mean, wow. But yeah, it's a wild scene. The guy never speaks. He never opens his mouth. And then in the scene right after it, when Pacino is saying, why'd you have to hit me so hard? He, he like tips the hat off the black eye and flies out the window. Yeah. He's sitting near a window reading a paper. He, again, he doesn't <laughs> Smoking speak. Smoking a cigar. Yeah, he doesn't speak. Man doesn't speak. <laughs> he tips his hat out the window. It's a very funny scene. Um... But getting to like the, the 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 graphic side of this, it the, the sex you don't really see the sex you don't see really much any sex in the movie, except for like in that very first kill in the beginning, where there's that insert of like of of the sex Hardcore scene like yes sex. yes and that's only on the anniversary DVD it's yeah not the that that was release. not in in the theatrical I I do because. One of the reasons uh, this movie had to get an R rating back then, I think they had to kind of throw that out. Yeah. And he, the movie was cut a bunch of times to get this R rating. But again, Friedkin insists that it was, you know, it was nothing that was so important that was cut to get that R rating that messed with the integrity of the film itself. Um, I mean, I don't know. Part of me thinks that there probably was or is some other shit out there somewhere, or there, but it's probably gone. I mean, these... These things happen, a 40-year-old movie, you know? I mean, 
uh, that sits on a shelf somewhere in a movie studio that has thousands upon thousands of movie canisters sitting around and, and, and limited space as time marches on, right? Yeah, so, throw it out. But the, the violence is really more, I think, uh, off-putting than the sex or sexuality. Yeah, there, there's no graphic sex, but the violence is like definitely on par with like a slasher film, especially of that era. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of blood and just um, very like they show very graphic displays of fear too and terror. Yeah, you know, like you know, the, the people are getting murdered. You know, they seem scared, and it's like a very unsettling um, move. You know, especially at that time. You know what I mean. Well, uh, the thing is, uh, when the movie came out, it finally came out in the beginning of, of, of 1980. Uh, it was panned. It, you know, it, it didn't do very well. Um, you know, Roger Ebert, he gave it two and a half stars back then out of four. Said it was well filmed and suspenseful, but it seemed to make a, a, a conscious decision not to declare itself on its central subject. He actually felt that... Huh. We don't know much about Pacino at all, really, or, or about what, you know what I'm saying, about his his kind of, like, past or any of his kind of, you know, background, like, background or, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, why would a young policeman jump right into this assignment except for just, I mean, uh, promotion, sure, but, like, you know, there, there has to be maybe something more there. Yeah, that's a really good point because... He is this. It kind wasn't of, explored. Yeah, is what it is. Like some of these things were not explored. Some of the motives and some of the, you know, I mean, uh, things about the movie were not fully kind of explored. Basically, it's, if it was a different actor, I, I think that it would be more apparent that that there was like Pacino's character was almost like two dimensional because it's like he doesn't really like Pacino brings a lot to the role with like his expressions and his eyes and everything. Yes, yes. And you kind of think you know more about him than you do because of the way he acts. Like his well, acting there is one scene which I I had kind of forgot about because I was thinking to myself, okay, does Pacino have sex with a man at, at all in this movie? And there is a scene where he 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 I believe he does actually have sex with a man. Which scene do you think that was? Um, it's it's one of the ones in the park, not the final one that yeah, ends in the the, the, the you know the the standoff. There's another scene um, that it just cuts and and it's the next day the next day oh yeah okay yes yep there's another so scene. there's an implication that yeah he's... oh yeah I mean, and this all kind of actually informs what our sort of i think you and i both agree about the ending of this film mm. you know now the other thing is uh the actor richard cox who plays Stuart richards who becomes what we all feel as the viewer uh the the the, the bad guy the main guy in this movie um, the, the, he, he, his character gets the, the more kind of developed, the most developed, I would say, yeah. in, in the movie, because you get to that flashback of him talking to his dad, mm-hmm. and he has all those letters yep. that has all that the, the weird writing in it, and um, the, the father, he, he's sitting down, with him, and the dad just looks kind of like disapproving, and he tells his son, you know what you have to do, and it's like... It's almost like, well, is, does that mean, like, is a father telling him to kill? It's like, th- that's why you kind of think, oh, okay, here's our bad guy. Here's our killer, you know? Um, but, like, what the, the father's disapproval pertaining to the son being, being gay and, and the son trying to win back the father's approval by killing these people, like, is that what that that's was? Like, there's just kind of yeah. these things, like, you know, you don't really know, you know? Um, but in the book version, Steve Burns' character is fleshed out more than, than in the movie, which is why I'd like to get my hands on the book, which, uh, if, if you looked for it on eBay or Amazon, it's very pricey. Um, I mean, you could probably maybe, you know, a secondhand bookshop one day, some would be selling for like a buck because they don't know what it is, but it's like a 50 to a hundred dollar book. Uh, the hardcover being more than a hundred, but the paperback is like, yeah, you know, like 50 to a hundred bucks, which is interesting. For a little paperback, I, I saw pictures of it. It's not a very big book. No, it's thin. It's like 120 pages or something. Mm-hmm. Like that. Yeah. Um, but again, as you're watching it, and if you pay close attention to the kill scenes, the the faces all don't even match up to 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 uh, uh, Stewart, the Stewart character. And there's a final confrontation towards the end, where him and Al Pacino. 
uh, are in the park. Well, before that, Al Pacino stakes out because Al Pacino, you know, believes he's the killer too. And Al Pacino stakes out his apartment. And he borderline and harasses right, him. Right. He does borderline. He yeah. gets it to his apartment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he goes through his things and he, he fucks with him a bit. But then they finally uh, are, are in one of the clubs and they meet in the park. Oh, wait, do they? Do they well, I actually, I just kind of messed they up. They have like order. an encounter. An encounter, yeah, right. And, and it's, it's like, in the park and they're yeah. like, you know, they decide they want to hook up with each other because. Right. But it's like all aggressive and right. like weird. Right, it is all aggressive yeah. and weird. He doesn't think Al Pacino's a cop doing this. He thinks he's, he's a, a guy doing this. He doesn't think Al's a cop, I don't think. No. Now, as they're about to hook up, it is kind of interesting because it almost does seem like Al Pacino is about to kill him, right? Yeah, I picked up on that. I rewatched, I was like, wait a second, this scene is not how I'm remembering it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and he he gets stabbed, uh, uh, the Stewart character, the I'm just calling him the bad guy, even though he's actually not really the bad guy, possibly at all. Um, you, you cut to the scene in the hospital where... Uh, he, Stewart is in the hospital, his ribs, whatever, are taped up. And Al Pacino is there, and Paul Sorvino is there. And they're talking to him about cutting a deal and whatnot and confessing. They're talking to him about confessing. Right. And Stewart's character says in that creepy voice, I didn't kill anyone. And it's like, well, why, why would he say? I mean, it, I mean, look, sure, a lot of times perpetrators get caught. That's what they say. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Yeah. But he just goes like, I didn't kill anyone. Like he says it in like this very kind of serious, stern kind of voice. Having rewatched it two nights ago, I'm convinced he did kill at least one person in the movie. So that that is taken with a grain of salt. Now, which brings us to the final scenes of the movie. Uh, the Ted character who I brought up, we find, uh, is, is sadly brutally murdered the worst murder in the film actually uh, yeah, uh, yeah is brought upon by the nicest guy in the movie which is mm -hmm. a very interesting scene like uh it's it's in this building that uh where a pacino's right, character was living yeah. uh by the way the ted character's roommate um, we kind of glanced over this yeah. was james remar yep and james remar is also kind of a suspect in this movie because James Remar was kind of was really angry kind of guy. He's cannon, you know. Uh -huh. And he, and he treated Ted like shit. Yep. And they was violent, and they would have fights. And James Remar and Al Pacino get into a fight. But guess what, man? I just watched this movie two nights ago. Al Pacino is way more the aggressor than James Remar. Again, Al Pacino bursts in the door and starts punching on him. So it's like, wait a second, is. Is Al Pacino the fucking murderer in this whole movie? I don't think that he's the murderer in the movie, but I think that he he's not. Well, first of all, I think there's multiple guys. Killed. Yes, I. Well, we're gonna get yeah, to that right now. That. Yeah. Um, we we find that Ted is is dead, and the cop is talking. The Paulie is there, and he's getting information, and he's like, "Oh, there was a, another guy in the building, uh, Forbes, but the landlady hasn't seen him in days," and and Sorvino's face gets a little weird. He's like. Hmm, that's that's interesting. Like you know, um, so Pacino is back into the the good graces uh, of of Karen Allen into their apartment after having a weird moment where like he can't connect with her during all this undercover you know gay stuff. Yeah, and she's you know she's looking around the apartment. She opens up a closet, or whatever, and she sees the leather hat and the leather jacket, all this heavy and leather the glasses, gear. All this, and the viewer, as me, I'm wondering, well, why did he keep all this? The assignment is over. They got the bad guy, so to speak. The, the killer has been caught. And here's Al Pacino bringing his job home with him right after he had said to her, everything's okay, I'm going to explain everything, he says to her. He's like, hugs her, and he kisses her, and he goes to the bathroom to shave. And she's looking through these things, and she puts on mm -hmm. the hat and the glasses and, and the jacket, and she is transformed as well. And it's very, very interesting ending in this movie. Al Pacino is looking in the mirror and looking right at the camera and looking right at the viewer. And it, and then you see the boat, the harbor, where the movie began, where the body parts, uh, you know, showed up. And then it, it movie is end. Movie well, the cuts to a scene of of a, of a guy wearing a leather jacket. Yes, at yes. Night sorry about that. Walking yes, walking towards a club, which is what you see also early on. Yeah. Again, you don't know who he is. He has uh -huh. dark hair, and he he could be he could be Al Pacino. It could be any one of these guys in this movie with the dark hair. 
And I just think it's a fucking brilliant ending. And as I've watched it more, like I said, I've found really cool things about it. And never more have I thought that Al Pacino was at least responsible for killing uh, Ted than I do now, having rewatched it again. And one you more he thing. Killed Ted? Yes, the guy huh. who he liked. I, I oh, just, because, oh, all right. Because uh, Stewart is in the hospital. How did Stewart kill Ted? The only other option is James Remar killing Ted. I think James, all right. I think James Remar killed Ted, Ted because okay. they had a volatile relationship. Right. There was fighting. And he, I believe murder was not too far out of that guy's reach. You know? But he was like a dancer. Yeah, he wasn't but also, a, but also. He wasn't, I don't know if he was a murderer. Yeah. That's the thing. I think that's what Freakin' wants you to do. Yeah. And there's one more thing picked up on. There's this little nursery rhyme in the movie that the killer says once or twice where he goes, who's here? I'm here. We're here. And sure enough, Al Pacino says it in the ending scene when him and Stuart are about to hook up. Only one little problem. At no point in the movie did anyone tell Al Pacino oh, about shit. that nursery rhyme. Wow. How the hell does he Dude. know that nursery rhyme? You cracked the case. I think I just cracked the goddamn Damn. case. I think Al Pacino is one of several killers huh. in this movie. Do you think that he was killing and he took the assignment? The only way that is a possibility... Is because is if we go by the book's odd backstory, because we don't have a backstory in the movie. But that's I don't know. Yeah. Again, I don't know if he's the killer in the whole movie, but he might have done at least one or two of the murders in the movie. Huh. And Stewart might have done that one murder in the, in the Peep Show. Yeah. Because yeah. it was his prints. They do right. say that they got that Stewart's prints on prints that. In there, yeah. But all those other ones, I don't even think were Stewart. Or, like he said, I didn't kill anybody. <laughs> it's a mind fuck. The movie's a mind fuck, dude. It really is. Yeah. And it's 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 funny how much more I'm getting out of it now as opposed to 10, 15 years ago when well, I first yeah. saw it. I mean, this is a movie that I've been watching for like 20-something years, man. Wow. I mean, I love it. I've seen, I saw this movie like probably on VHS when I was like in high school or something, you know? I did not. I did not see it until into my 20s, so yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. then- periodically it's just i like, heard about it yeah. i heard all about it and i think in my head i thought it was way more of a graphic gay movie than what it really no, was no i always i didn't realize the, that in it, it that it's really kind of something i mean that's look there is the the, the homosexual aspect to it and like the s&m kind of like biker manly yeah so, like aspect to it um but as like a young teenager hearing about things, like, oh, I don't want to see that. But as I got older, I got more into films and I read more about films and I got more into Al Pacino. I was like, I need to see this movie. And the very fact that Al Pacino never says a goddamn word about this movie made me want to see it more. So I finally got to see it in my 20s. I saw this with my parents. Wow. Yeah, now that's wild. Yeah, my parents rented this on uh, VHS tape when I was a kid. I also saw The Exorcist with my parents. Too. Oh, that's cool. So, I mean, they're like, you know, my parents used to, being, you know, I used to rent all these like weird garish films, <laughs> and like, so that, and I was like, I didn't quite. I'm like, wow, this is almost like like a slasher film, you know what I mean? Mm. But it's like, it's like an extreme crime movie, yeah. Which is something I've always I've always loved all those '70s crime films too. So and, like, and I have to talk the, the music, the uh, yeah. the score uh, is great, but the the score is unavailable. On the actual soundtrack, the soundtrack has all the actual songs in the movie, which is a lot of like the cool punk. late seventies, early eighties hard rock, and it has a germ song, germ it has some punk on it, yeah. it, has that great Willie Deville song, "It's So Easy," which might be one of the the greatest rock songs I've ever heard in my life. It's only like two and a half minutes long, and it's where uh, Quentin Tarantino put it in uh, "Death Proof." Oh, uh, okay. It's yeah, it's it's in "Death Proof" like two times. Um, it it closes out. Uh, it's, well, it's in the movie. It's in Cruising twice, actually, they use it. But it closes the movie. It's like a great song to close out the movie. Um, the Germs actually recorded six songs for this movie, and only one was used, the song Lion Chair, that's on the soundtrack. You can find the soundtrack on uh, the vinyl. It wasn't really that hard to find. I got it uh, for a decent price on eBay. Then there was like this, this very limited CD of it. But I got, uh, in the days of the IMDB uh, message boards, yeah, yeah. a guy posted on it saying anyone want a free cdr of the soundtrack Shit. and like 20 people 
and I got it mailed to me. So I've, I've had a CDR, the soundtrack, for a very long time. That's like, pretty badass. Yeah, you know. Um, and then I got the vinyl later on. But the music is great. But the I wish the score, which is this great kind of creepy mm -hmm. background music, was on there. And it's not. None of it is, which kind of sucks. It's on YouTube, though. You can hear it on YouTube. It's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I I uncovered a few new things, Mike, from, from watching. I have to watch it yet again now. Now you have to watch now, it. Now, with your analysis, I have to. it informs me. At no point does anyone tell him about that who's oh, here, I'm fuck, here. man. I have, to, I have to go back and watch it again now. Yeah. yeah. Well, for me, I give this easily a five. Yeah, right? this is a five, five movie. Fiber, I mean, man. I, I think it's, it's it, look, time has been kinder to this movie. It was very dismissed. And I think, look, maybe rightfully so, it was very misunderstood and dismissed at the time. And I could totally see why. I totally get the arguments why. William Friedkin, even back then, though, said that it was not a take on gay culture. It was just so happened that this it was a murder mystery movie and a thriller movie and the backdrop of the thriller was the S&M scene and you know it was it wasn't his thoughts on what he felt about homosexuality he had many gay friends in Hollywood of course working in Hollywood and you know he never meant any harm by the movie um on another, another interesting side note Richard Gere uh initially had shown interest and was at one point, going to be in this movie, uh, which obviously didn't, you know, didn't happen. And also, at one point, Steven Spielberg was approached to do this movie, and uh, he had turned it down. I think it would have been a, a, a much different movie had Spielberg uh, got a shot at it. But yeah, this is a, a five for me. I think every one of our, our uh, listeners should check this movie out if they haven't already. And if they have... With the, the new information they're armed <laughs> with, they should watch it again. Um, I don't know. Th there's going to be a section that people uh, of listeners that won't like it, and that's fine. Yeah, definitely. But if you're if you're into jazz, if you're into thrillers, if you're into anything late seventies, early eighties, that you know that the shit me and Mike reference a lot, this is a movie for you. That's like probably my favorite era of film, really, too, man. It's oh the 70s. yeah, it's like some of my favorite shit came out in the seventies and early eighties, but specifically mm -hmm. that. The way the films looked in the seventies, like mm -hmm. I, just, I just watched Thief again. I have the Blu-ray. Oh, nice! Criterion. I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, it's a good it's movie, great. man. That's a great movie. They just don't make movies like that. No, anymore. they really and don't. When they try, they <laughs> fucking fail. All right, the the good. I think Drive looked good, and it was a good attempt. And it's it it may not have been seventy seventies. It was it was modern, but it was it had a nice seventy sensibility. And it, it wasn't a fail. No, like it, well, it worked. It referenced. It, it's the only way you can pull it off is if you have like a. There's two ways I think. If you reference the 70s mm. and put it in modern times, which is what Drive did. Mm. It was like a you know that could have taken place in like the 90s. Or yeah, like because there wasn't. It wasn't. There was no you know over overt use of like modern things, and it, it was just. It almost was timeless that or, movie, or even if, though it was modern. It took yeah. place now. Or, or if you do it in this kind of like Tarantino, like postmodern, self-referential way. Right. Where there's like a little bit of satire. but A it's, little tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. But if you try, like whenever they, I just think they don't have actors like James Caan and no. like Al Pacino anymore. No. You just don't have guys like that can do that shit. Well, it's funny. Nicholas Wending Refn has, has the rights to do What Have You Done to Solange? He's, mm -hmm. uh, so he, he obviously loves right. Jallos and he, he's obviously a fan of, yeah. of the 70s and 80s. Um, so I wonder I like what the hell is going to happen with that. I have that movie. It's a great movie, I'll by see the way. That. I'll it's watch it. I'll see Ref and do yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. What Have You Done to Solange is very, very creepy jalo uh, involving young teenage girls, and it's it's a good one. Cool music. But yeah, we both give uh, five out of fives for uh, William Friedkin's Cruisin'. You must see it. All right, we're going to move right along here, everybody, uh, into... The, the Devil's Candy. The Devil's Candy. So many people loved this movie. It got a lot of great feedback, and it's got a lot of great reviews. And um, I think, you know, I, I liked it, but I think it's one of the more overhyped movies of 2017. 
I was really, overhyped. really stoked about it when yes. I saw the trailer. Mm-hmm. The trailer looked fucking amazing. Yes. Man. I was like, oh, there's some, you know, fucking dude with like a running suit on and like, yeah, yeah. you know, this heavy metal, you know. Like, like it was, it, you didn't know what the hell it was, right? No, it just looked like it was going to be some over the top, like creepy, like film. But um, yeah, I, I didn't love it. I didn't I liked hate it. it. Right. Yeah. I didn't love it. I liked it. One of the best things about this movie, before you, you we go a little more into it, obviously, is I think <laughs> it will it has it will go down for me as the best portrayal of a metalhead father and daughter I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> like honestly, I could see that. It yeah. was actually it was a good yeah. portrayal of metalheads. Finally, finally, after th- the last good portrayal of metalheads, Mike was River's Edge thirty years ago. Okay, and that was a and that was negative portrayal, and that was a negative portrayal. Yeah. But it was realist. It was to me, it was at least gritty and realistic. Because in 1987, I saw that as like a 13, 14 year old, and I was like, okay, I, I like these are people I know. These are the older people in my neighborhood, totally. like the older kids, two, three years older than me, obviously. Because um, I was, yeah, I was like 13, 14 when that came out. And I loved that movie. And I was like, wow, finally, he's someone who looks a little like me in a movie. And I, all this corny crap of, of metal heads in movies has not really come close to what I think. It has in this little movie here sure. <laughs> because the dad, although the, there's like a bad wig going on. I think there was a little bit of a bad, like there's some weird hair thing going on. See, a lot of people said that, but I don't, even, I don't know who Ethan Embry is though. But the guy who plays he, the main character. He's in uh, Vegas Vacation. He played Rusty oh. in Vegas Vacation. Oh. I only learned this recently. Huh. Okay. But anyway, but he's in a few other movies too, um, indie movies. Now, I just bought that he was into metal. And I bought that his daughter was him, like the father, daughter metalheads, and the mom isn't. And I thought that was kind of like nice. Like it was like the mom was like kind of he married a, kind of normal. Like how yeah. many metalhead guys marry non-metal people? Pretty most. A lot, I mean, right? I exactly. Say, yeah. Maybe not all, yeah. but most. I feel like most of my ma- married metalhead friends are married to wives that don't listen to fucking Deicide. So I mean. I thought that that was actually really cool and a, and a feather in the cap of and, director and Sean Brown. And that daughter followed down that path of mm. like being into metal and wanting to play guitar. Yes, I like thought that, that was yeah. a viable and believable, and I thought it was really cool. Yeah. I was like, finally. <laughs> but yeah, it, the uh, directed by uh, Sean uh, Sean Byrne, um, and yeah, this Ethan Embry is a star. Uh, Shuri Appleby, Kiara Glasgow, Pruitt Taylor, Vince, Craig Nye. And Marco Perella. Um, this is another one of those movies, though. This damn movie was supposed to come out in 2015. Yes, and it was put much, out this, this year. Much like uh, Black Coats. Yep. It, it's a sit on a shelfer. But, you know, I think that's kind of like a common thing with these types of mm. films, though, because they're, they're, you know, very indie. And then IFC Midnight ends up grabbing them and putting them out. Or A24. Yeah, yep. or A24. IFC Midnight or A24. Thank God for those guys. Yeah. Jesus. And not all the IFC Midnight stuff's good, but at least no. it gives a, a platform for right. these people to put That's, their movies I mean, out. hey, if I'm, if I'm a, a burgeoning horror director, believe me, I want to be in bed with, with one of these companies. You know what I'm saying? You, your movie will get seen. It's not going to be shown in the major multiplex but it'll get shown in the. You'll get your art house showing for a couple of weeks, possibly, or at least a weekend, you know. But you know the way most people consume film these days. It'll art, get seen, right? Yeah, no, no one. I mean, how many people? All right, you go to a big theater to see like the Avengers, mm-hmm. you know, and it's ex- fucking expensive. So yeah. you want to see some big overblown film in like that setting. But you know, a movie like this or like The Void or something. You know, you you'll, you and I saw that in the theater. Yeah, it was that's something that we are geeks about. We wanted to see it. I saw Carrie, the original Carrie, two weeks ago in Nighthawk. Oh, um, on a date. Yes, yeah, great. And um, Look at you. It, thank you. And it was great. It was so great to see Carrie on a big screen. Sure, like you know what I'm saying. But that's a hard sell for like I say, 85 percent of the people though that would. I mean. I'm just saying, not like it's it's. I, I'm there. I love it. I'm. A, you don't gotta sell me, but like I think a lot of people just want to watch shit on their iPads these days. I know. You know, or on Apple TV, and or not something. just and not just the youngins too. It's, yeah. it's it's. You know what I'm saying? So, so, I think you're so right. for their the, the lack of a, a proper, you know, ex, you know, extensive theatrical release, I don't think is really hurting films. And there's like direct to you know the direct market where where the films get out and people can actually That's, see you're it. right i think ultimately with these movies these these smaller to mid-sized horror movies the goal is eyes 
like you know what I'm saying? It's not theaters. It's overall eyes and buzz. Because you, you know, know I don't think I would have spent uh, you know whatever sixteen dollars in it to see this in a movie. No, nah, I would have been a little like, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I would spend sixteen dollars to see Carrie or The Void or something like that. Or you, you know, it's I, it's funny. Years ago, I people would have scoffed at showing a really old movie in a theater. And now I feel like, no, people aren't scoffing at that anymore because sometimes they do well. Yeah. Or at least they, they, they generate some nice money on it. You know, and if, you're, if, you're, if the movie comes out from a different era, like these films from the 70s that you and I probably didn't see in the theater when we yeah. were kids, it was like, to, to be able to experience it in the setting that it was meant to be seen in, you know, in a, in a theater, is, is fucking beautiful. I just got my ticket for Suspiria in 4K. That's nice. going to be great. It's That's October killer. 21st at Landmark Sunshine. That's going to be awesome. They're they're showing Suspiria at Nighthawk. It's sold out in three minutes, Damn. but it's not this. It's not this one. It's mm-hmm. not the, the the Synapse Films 4K. I think it's this Italian print that doesn't look as good. So I wasn't feeling too bad about missing out on that um, because they are rolling out that long-awaited Blu-ray. It's coming out, I think, before the end of the year from wow. Synapse, which. First Christmas. American Blu-ray of Suspiria ever with Good like Christmas it's gift. supposed to look better. It's supposed to, like they've shown the screen caps of it and it just it looks like so fucking good, and it's a little bit of a, a slightly longer cut or something. It, like it's supposed to be like unbelievable, but anyway, back to um, <laughs> Devil's, Devil's Candy. Candy. All right, so the movie opens up with Ray playing a doom metal riff in his uh, in his room, which is a pretty nice n- nice riff. I gotta say, yeah, it's, it's like a nice this, riff. It's sort of like cool. sun, you know, vibe. To yes. It. Oh like yes. This, Drony sludge and riff. son has the is has a music credit yes <laughs> um he hears voices you know it's like that my one of my things is like how obvious a lot of shit was in this movie mm. you know ray hears voices ray is a disturbed man okay ray kills he lives in this house mm-hmm. and he kills his mom or whoever his sister i think sister, that was sister, yeah. sister this, this lady and um and then someone finds him out, and he murders him, too. So there's two murders in this house. Mm. Now, what I'm not clear about is, did he get apprehended, or did he just disappear? I don't think he was apprehended Yeah, I think all. he just disappeared into the night after he killed yep. those two. Because later on, like the next scene, actually, we find uh, um, Jesse, who is uh, you know, Ethan Embry and his family. Mm-hmm. They're, uh, you know, they're sort of reluctantly going to buy what turns out to be, they consider to be their dream home. Yep. You know, because, uh, you know, Jesse is a, a struggling artist. You know, he wants, needs space, trying to make his, make his work yeah, happen. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and the price is right because two people were murdered there. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and the real estate guy's like, I have to let you know. Disclosure. Killed here. Disclosure, yeah. You know. So, you know, they move, you know, they, they move take the, the house. They obviously. take the house, obviously. Yeah. If they didn't take the house, we wouldn't have a film. Or we'd have it with other people, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, real we, we'll tell. All right. So as they're settling in, um, Jesse begins to hear voices. Yes. You know, he starts to sort of catch on to the essence of this building while he's and, uh, painting. While he's painting, and he starts painting um, what I'm what I'm going to call the incantation covers. Man, yeah, they're pretty definitely. cool looking. It almost it almost looks like that Miran Kim art. I love that yeah. art so much. Uh huh. They're, very, like they're very, really the real creeped out kind of stuff. Very extreme, very very metal looking oh, imagery, yeah. like devils and cru- upside, you know, crucifixes <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, it's great. And then now this is where where I was like, okay, Ray was never apprehended because he just creepily shows up at their house one day, mm-hmm. um, and he starts talking to Zoe about music. Okay, so now Ray likes metal, obviously. Yes, he plays guitar. Yes, Zoe, the daughter, likes metal. Is a burgeoning metalhead mm-hmm. you know young girl into you know metallica and whatever her dad listens to yeah oh and metallica music is in the movie i went they must have paid for that oh they I had imagine to. that wasn't cheap to come by no there's there's, 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 there's pantera there's there's major metal yeah. music in the movie yeah. so there were some bucks behind this you know yeah. definitely um so then you know ray is insists that he needs to get back into this house because he lives there yeah you know what i mean and um of course jesse doesn't let him in because some big fat. It's creepy, his house now. It's, it's his house. Crazy guy, right? And yeah. Some fat, creepy dude who wearing a running suit just shows up and is, mm. you know, th- you know, possibly going to molest his daughter. And, oh <laughs> and yeah, like, there's definite vibe of that. Yeah, you know, the real unspoken creepiness about this guy. Um, so the next day, 
they find a guitar and amplifier set up for the dog. Set outside so the, uh, the fence of the just, house. Just yeah. chilling outside, you know, outside of the fence. And, of course, um, Jesse's, you know, not for, you know, Zoe keeping this thing, you know. And she's upset because she wants it, and, you know, she wants to play guitar, blah, blah, blah. So Ray's artwork, it kind of, what ends up happening is his artwork sort of mirrors some of the unsavory acts that are going on with, with Ray. Yes, and it also, he, well, he paints his daughter's face screaming in fire. In fire. And early on, that's one of yeah. the first weird things. Yeah. The wife sees that. But so his, his artwork is like, it's like he's, he's hearing voices. He's spending a lot of time and he loses time. Like he'll Yeah, he's there. late to pick up his daughter. He's like he late. starts fucking up, basically. He starts fucking up because he's so drawn into the energy of this house. Yep. And he's like channeling, you know. So I guess what, what I'm getting at is the house itself is probably the catalyst for all the evil that goes yes. on. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, where it's like, when Ray lived there, Ray Ray might have just been like, you know, some basement dwelling. Yeah, he might have been a fairly normal guy, guy at one point, and then the house fucking fucked him up. Yeah, and the house like, you know, gained control of him and turned him into a murderer. Right, right. That's know? kind of what I got. Yeah. So you know, Jesse's sort of uh, channeling all this negative energy that's in the house, and it's coming out in his artwork. Instead of going out and killing, it's actually manifesting in his creative endeavors, mm. which in but maybe because both of these guys are existing in the same continuum. Mm. There's like a predictive, a predictive um, aspect to his artwork. Yes. You know, cause there's like, you know, Ray, Ray's out there in the world. He likes kids. Yes. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah. There's like a, there's like a pedo vibe vibe to him too as well. Yeah. There, there was there, there, some subtleties of that stuff there. Yeah. There, there was, they, they didn't shy away from it because he ends up murdering two, two young kids and, yeah, you know, which is true. kind of creepy, I think, you know. Yes, that's true. Um, but I feel like as as I was watching it, like I was I was drawn in in the beginning, and I was drawn in kind of in the middle, and I just felt like somewhere along the way I was just not giving a crap well, about this movie. Yeah, because like they they put together a good pre- premise, I think, mm. but they ultimately I don't think in the third and fourth act of this film that they really like fleshed it out. Yes. It's like they ran out of like they ran out of steam. They ran out of steam somewhere along the line because there's just um it feels like rushing to get to the end. Hmm. You know what I mean? Well, the thing is uh what's his name? Uh Jesse has a, an art dealer. We're, we're forgetting about that aspect, Bel- the Belial, the, yeah. the the sell your soul to the devil aspect of the movie. <laughs> um which I don't know. I thought that- that was very, that was, like, when you learned about that aspect of it, I was like, oh, it's one of these movies. I've seen this 800 times It's, like, already. too heavy-handed, you know Yeah, I'm like, saying? I've seen this before. Oh, he's kind of, it's, he's selling his soul to the devil to do the good artwork to, and the, and the, the, the payment is his soul and the death of his family or whatever. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. blah, 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 blah. It's very obvious. Very obvious, you know? Um, what set this one apart was the musical aspect and the metalhead aspect and, you know, the father-daughter thing. Like, there are things about it that do make it kind of interesting in the horror world. And I think maybe help get this movie some nice reviews and some different buzz because of where it came from. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I agree But the that. actual plot points are done a trillion times. Well, the thing, he, he abducts Zoe twice. Mm. You know, he, he abducts her and takes her to a motel room. He duct tapes her up, okay? So, Ray. Ray does, Ray. Yeah, the, the, the guy in the running suit. Yes. Zoe gets away. She escapes, okay? Yes. She goes back home. <laughs> and I'm like, why the hell? C- There's fucking- some very unbelievable things it's in like, this movie. Like, fuck, I know it's a movie, man. and there's supposed yeah, to be unbelievable like, things in it, but it's like, man. That, that whole sequence, I thought, was like kind of unnecessary in a lot of ways. Because mm. what happens is like, all right, well, now the police are involved. They, put two, they station two cops there to watch the house. Ray shows up, he kills the cops, and then like, you know, all hell breaks loose in the house. The the you know Jesse and his wife get get shot. At, is her name Astrid? I think. Yeah, Astrid. And then he's gonna burn that. Now Ray, like, why the fuck is he gonna burn the house down? <laughs> why? Yeah, he's got the girl. He's got the girl. He could just doesn't have doesn't he just have to kill her. He only well, I wanted. think he has to burn. I think that's how he, she has to die, according yeah, to the why, devil thing. Though? It's like I don't. It's like, there's some stuff like logic, like, that's what I mean. It's like, 
it's it wasn't there wasn't enough like explanation of some of the motivations i think it's like no, no. you know ray, ray ray that's ray's house right yeah. ray lived there so he shot the, the you know the the two adults and they're you know could have started pouring the gasoline in the house yeah and then astrid who you who we we think is is dead yeah she wakes up oh there's a lot of times people should completely be dead and they're awake right. that happens like two twice well even it happens with jesse too right Astrid wakes up, and and she wakes Jesse up, who I totally thought was fucking dead, yeah. uh, who, who was also shot. Um, <laughs> he takes his wife outside, and he returns to save Zoe. Him and him and Ray fight in this ridiculous fire that nobody could have ever gotten out alive in. Yeah, totally. And he he manages to kill Ray with the guitar that Ray gave to his daughter. Like you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like the final. Now let me say something blow. here. If you are wounded and you've lost enough blood, he's shot you lose, like shot, shot. Yeah. Right. If Ray you is, lose consciousness, I mean Jesse. Jesse has been like shot by Ray. Like if shot. you lose consciousness from blood loss, mm-hmm. there's no fucking way you're gonna. That have you're gonna that, run upstairs kind of energy into to take a this guy burning out. building that is 98 percent engulfed in flames. Yeah, man. man. By the way, so so that that shot. The ending was shot. I thought the and ending. yeah, he he kills him, and he rescues the the the, the, the daughter out of the fire. And they sit outside, and Jesse remembers his painting, leading you know, leading him in to go in the forest where he finds the bags of kids' bodies that Ray buried, um, because you know Ray's a child killer. Ray's a killer. Yeah, essentially, that's. And his... as the, the sun comes up, Jesse looks to the sky and smiles and cries, and the movie's over. Now, I don't know. Like I said, they were interesting things about yes. this movie. I like the metal aspect. I like the father daughter thing. Um, the music. Other than that, a kind of uh, something I've seen before many times. I thought the the premise of the story was it started off pretty cool. Yes, it's like it started this, it know, started well. Yeah, you know, house evil spirit paintings. It's like disturbing, sort of like you know, channeling this like energy. But they could have went so much. They could have went creepier for sure. Yeah, and some of the plot things, like some of the. Um, mechanisms they used to tell a story were just it's almost like when when he abducted zoe the first time it's almost like they had to come up with like four extra minutes for the movie or yeah that was like, that. like useless and like pointless part yeah, of the movie geez, there's no fucking way she's, he's like duck she's duct taped yeah she got out of duct how the hell did she get out of that yeah yeah well this this director sean Byrne, directed a movie that's apparently really good called loved the loved ones that i, I want to see okay because that actually got some nice reviews and that led him to this second film this movie has ninety two percent fresh with oh, thirty six yeah. reviews. Actually, we I want to get in, I want to get into this. <laughs> this is what I don't understand. Look, I know Rot- Rotten Tomatoes is a scam. Okay. Oh my god. This movie got ni- I-, I saw ninety two percent, but an audience score of sixty eight. Okay. okay. So, is it is Rotten t- Rotten Tomatoes? My I used to think that it was compiled from from users, right? Originally. Mm. So now, who the fuck? Gave it ninety two percent if only sixty eight of the audience people. Like I don't understand how Rotten Tomatoes works. Yeah, I, guess. I actually don't use the site, but I do look at it from time to time. Well, I think on in this in these cases as a metric, we should be kind of <laughs> cool to be like, all right, well, Rotten Tomatoes says this, and the audience says this. Mm. And I feel like the audience gets it right. Well, v- Variety, Dennis Harvey from Variety, a bit of a sophomore slump because apparently he liked loved ones. And it was ultimately a lively but underdeveloped B horror movie. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, Hollywood Reporter said, "Decently acted, but disappointing follow-up to Loved Ones." Yeah, you know, I mean, the acting was good. You know, it was believable. I think everyone. No, did the good acting job. actually was good, uh, but from the, the family, I think uh, yeah. uh, the, the mother, the and father, and Prue the kid. Taylor Vince. And he was great. Good. No, he was good. He was creep. Good. But. Just the movie itself, eh. I don't know why people are loving this movie so much. I don't get it. What do you out of possible five, what are you giving this movie? I'm gonna give it a three. I'm giving it a two point five. Two point five. I mean a two point five. I Ooh, I'm okay. never gonna watch this movie ever again. Yeah, you know what? You're probably right. <laughs> yeah. See, I thought all right, me, all right, so okay. You know, this is a good question. This is a very good mm. in- thing right here. It's almost like in the UFC. Like it, it's not terrible. Rounds. Okay. Yeah. Less than two point five means Garbage. I'm never watching again, and it was terrible. All right, this movie was so not let's terrible. So let's set a let's set a standard here. Okay, mm. so for two, uh, in order for a film to get a two point five, we have to de- deem it 
not worthy of repeated viewings. Yeah, I would say so. Definitely. Okay. All right. So that's the that's the point. That, that's the that's point. the criteria. Yes. Right Will you there. ever watch this again? Yes. I won't watch this again. No, either. me neither. So I'm, I'm no. going to ch- revise my score to match yours okay. at two point five. Yeah, because it's down the middle. Yeah. Um, a three. Look, it it inches to a three because. Believe me, in in the new crop of of, of 2017s out there, 2016s, and then the straight to video market or whatever, there's a lot, man, and there's a lot of shit, and this is probably better than a lot of it. So, you know, make your own decisions, people. You know what I'm saying? This movie got a lot of great reviews. Me and Mike just didn't say it was so great. You know? Yeah. So, take that for what it is. <laughs> but if people there are people out there who do go by what we say, so yeah. you know. So um it's a little bit overhyped. There's overhype. Yeah, definitely. I mean, hey, a lot of people felt there was a lot of overhype on the void wow. and the, on the witch and on it follows. Yeah. I, I think like all of them. I think those movies have justified hype. That's what I think. <laughs> so moving right along. Moving right along. Now this movie Mike liked a lot. Yeah. I, I did, actually brought this up yes. as like a movie to do. And I was like, Mike, you got to see this movie. Mike liked a lot. I did not really like it. But uh, this one, also some very, some nice reviews. And um, has a nice buzz on it, apparently. Uh, it is the Irish film, A Dark Song. Now, I want to say that though I did like this film, I had problems with it too. Okay. I'm not saying that. I, I'm not, it's not like a true blue slam dunk for me. Mm-hmm. There are parts of this movie I really, really enjoyed. Most most of the movie I really enjoyed, but there is some key elements to it that really didn't work for me. Mm. You know, so just keep that in the back of your head. Well, it is this. it is the director's first film. Uh, he had done some uh, some shorts that, that that were well received, apparently. Um, now, in in uh, in his. The Irish time in his in his you know home country it got some really nice reviews, uh, nifty novel Irish horror, uh, classy effort throughout you know um, it's you know a puzzling uh, mystery up until the the ending blah 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 you know now I don't know I just sometimes movies that have two people in them or three people in them you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. they can be to the viewer like. All right, what, what's the one that we really liked that had like essentially two people in it? The, the Clo- 10 Cloverfield Lane. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, to me, that was an example of a minimal cast that had me glued throughout the whole movie because of the story and because of the twists and turns and because of the performances. And, and a part of me in my head, I thought there was a goddamn monster out there and I just thought the whole thing was cool, blah, blah, blah. This movie, it works on a way more subtle level. It's two people, and they're trying to conjure a spirit. I like my ghost stuff, you know, but I just, I don't know. I just sometimes I need more when it comes to this type of horror. Like, you know what I mean? And I, the, I just wasn't getting more that I, that I, the more that I wanted and needed to be really drawn into this movie. One thing, though, and I was wrong, I thought that the guy... Uh, the actor, um, uh, S- uh, Steve Orm, Joseph Solomon, I thought he was a charlatan. I thought he was full of shit. Well, it start, that, that's what I'm getting. That's one of the things I want to definitely talk about. And he like, wasn't, no. actually. Yeah. And that, I was waiting for that punch. Like, I was waiting for that. Right. I was waiting for that. Yeah, yeah. And when that didn't come, I was like, oh, okay. But, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, like um, I thought he was just basically getting money and trying out of to, this like, woman. And that chick. Event. And abuse her yeah. and bang her and... Yeah. It didn't go there, so I thought that was cool. That 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 was actually cool. But I'll let you go yeah. a little more. Um, yeah, that was some. The thing is, there is essentially there's there's two actors in the yeah, film, two actors, and and the kid. Yep. Okay, her son. So you know, the movie opens up where we find the um, Victoria played by, or sorry, uh, Victoria played by Catherine Walker. Oh, uh, Sophia. 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 Why? Yeah. Why am I caught up with Victoria? Mm, that's okay. Yeah. All right, so we find Sophia, played by Catherine Walker, um, grief-stricken, mm-hmm. distraught, and she's uh, consulting uh, Joseph Solomon, mm-hmm. who we talked about just now, yep. um, an, occult, an occultist. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she, 
trying to secure his uh, services for something. And when he asks her why, she says, well, I love someone who doesn't love me. And he just fucking gets up and walks away. It's like, fuck yep. that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and this but guy- But he himself, he's wearing like a track suit. Yeah, he's like a he very- He uh, looks like an occultist. No, he looks no. like he's full of shit. He's like a typical, like what, what Americans, like a dude. I guess, like, like a, a know, typical some... British geezer, you yeah. know, like he's right. got like some hat. He's got beard. Smoking and, and drinking. And, he's, yeah. yeah, he's like a like typical a, dude. Looks like just some British guy, mm -hmm. you know, very British looking with the jacket and everything, you know, red hair, that kind of stuff. I'm probably offending Irish well, people. Well, he's Irish. There. He's not British. Yeah, it's, I'm like, yeah, it's like yeah, some yeah. British guy in the Irish. Like, <laughs> no. like, fuck you, mate. You know, like, he means he's like a typical guy is, is what we're trying to uh, say. From the UK and mm. the Republic of Ireland. Right. Like what right. you would see when you, go, or, you know, when you go to that section of the world. Just some geezer. Mm. You know, I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes, she comes clean with him. But you know what? She kind of continually lies to him. Yes. Because the thing is, is like, all right, so now he walks away when she's like, I like some, I love some dude. He doesn't love me. He's like, well, fuck that shit. This is bullshit. He walks away. She goes out. She's like, well, actually. It's for my dead son. It's for my dead son. And I want to talk to him again. I want to talk, to my, not, I want to talk to my dead son again. That's what she tells him. Yes. That's her story. That's to lure story. him in. But as we find later, that's not the whole truth. No. And that, it fucks things up a bit. Yes. Mm. Absolutely. You know, so, um. So, you know, they agree upon some amount of money and uh, they scout out some location out in the countryside. And, you know, he's, they, there's all these criteria, like it has to face like the cert, some certain direction or whatever and all this other stuff. And then he breaks down like the preparations, you know, about, you know, a diet, you know, and then abstinence from sex. And like, as soon as like he says, Abstaining from sex. Yeah, I, my my even, in my head. I was even like, masturbation. I'm like, yes, this guy's yes, like a little yes, creepy. Yes. You know, he's like, uh, you know, this is, you know, it's gonna come up again. Is what I'm trying to say. I got the yeah, the vibe. Yeah. So um, you know, she's she agrees to all that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Checked off all and the boxes. Pay you know, him and all that. She pays him, and um, so once again, like I said, like seven eight to this film is is pretty good. Okay. There's a lot of stuff I like about it. Yeah. But there's like some, some overtones that some Christians type, type shit that ends up kind of ruining it for me a little bit, mm. you know? So it starts out where there's these two people that are locked in the house. There's this ritual, which they're going to summon her guardian angel. Okay. Why a guardian angel? They're, they're into all this occult shit. All this like. That was weird too. I thought that was weird, right? I, I, I thought it was about the occult. And then suddenly we're talking, about, we're talking like, about, no, about angels. It's about an angel. Yeah. But I'm like, okay, no. I actually, now, he wasn't, like, I felt like he wasn't treating it as if she's summoning an angel. I felt like it was being treated as if someone's, like a dark thing. Like a, like well, he said like, it was a dark thing, but also they state how, you know, everyone has, like, some guardian, some, like, okay. angelic guardian that is, like, watching mm -hmm. over them and that... The way that she's going to talk to her dead son is through this guy, through her guardian angel. Mm. Okay, so they enter into this rigorous, months-long ritual when they're locked in the house, and they seal the house with like a salt ring yeah, and all like this other stuff. There's a white thing around you know? the house, outside the house. Yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, salt. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, with some of the uh, occultists that I know, it's debatable that salt actually is a uh, sealing. Hmm. It's, it's like they talk about how. Some people, you know, as a quick aside, that salt actually draws in negative energy. Ah, salt's instead of like, out. Salt is like mm -hmm. a desiccant. It absorbs stuff, whatever. Hmm. Whatever. You guys could look up that stuff on your own. <laughs> <laughs> That's for another day. Yeah. So he, um, you see that he's just like this abusive, you know, she has to, she's doing the dishes. She's doing laundry. She's making food for him. He's just fucking yelling at her all yeah, the it's time. Like, he's just treating her kind of like a dick and yeah. You know, and uh, and and they're doing these rituals like he's drawing sim you know sigils on the floor. She's shaving his back. She's shaving his, which is weird. weird. Yeah, why like, that? You know? Yeah, I don't know why that. He's got from. some weird Aleister Crowley like like gown and head yep. dress on. Mm -hmm. And each one, of, and he's describing to her like what each one of these like rooms is going to manifest some sort of like occult you know vibration. And then she's like, "Well, when does the angel show up?" Right, she's like, gets, well, she gets pissed because a lot of time passes and nothing has happened. She's yeah. like, when is something going to happen? What is going on? You know. Yeah, and that, at this point of the, of the movie, I'm very interested. The first time I saw it, I was like, <clears throat> very interesting. 
this is uh this movie might be about a guy who's full of shit. That's what I thought. And it might turn into this abuse film or something like that. Yeah, I thought it was gonna take one of those dark modern turns <laughs> of sex abuse. <laughs> exactly. And it just didn't happen. No, yeah. that's, that's not that's what, that's I not what it was yeah. going. Because that's what I thought. Yeah. Especially when he's like, you know, abstaining from sex and all this other stuff. And yeah, I didn't it kind really... of it kind of dangled that a little in front of the viewer. Yeah. But that doesn't happen. And I thought that once we started not seeing any supernatural stuff happening mm. and it, you know and you have you have the uh you know they, they they lay it out like this has been going on for weeks because they they were dug in for like a six month they had like six months of food and all this other stuff there right so um you start thinking that well this guy like locked himself in a, in a house with this like confused attractive lady he friggin' drowns her yeah and revives her. <laughs> exactly. She literally, she looks dead. Yeah. It was a, that was a weird scene. That was actually a good scene. Yeah. And then she brings it back. And they have a, they have a big fight. They yeah. start like she's a shoving match or whatever. And this big knife goes Well, actually, in. there's one scene we have to talk about. Oh, before. Okay. Yeah, 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 right, right. Right. <laughs> this was like, I like, I LOL during this scene. Because <laughs> I knew that this, I felt like something like this was coming. Because he was like, he's like, oh, you know, we mentioned the ritual sex, right? That's right. And she's like, I, what, what do you mean? He's like, you know, I was like, well, rich, there was ritual sex involved in this, right? So he gives her these instructions to, like, you know, put some makeup on and change your <laughs> shirt right. or whatever. And he's like, and he fucking, she comes out and he's like, you know, take down your pants and like take off your bra. And, and he's like, good looking lady, too. Yeah, right? she's very attractive. You know, and like, like, in a way that w British women or UK chicks and w women that live in the UK have a look to them certain mm -hmm. sometimes, and I really appreciate that. And she, mm. she had that look, and I, and I like that quite mm -hmm. a bit. Yes. So, you know, bend over, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, here we go. And the guy just starts whacking off, right? And he's like, ah, ah, ah. Yep. and it's all like uncomfortable. And yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. And then it turns out that there was it actually wasn't ritual sex. It was no. just he just needed to fucking. Get off! So he's like, I just needed to clear my head. I, I needed to get to my head right. Oh my god! And that's yeah, what that's starts right. yeah. the downward spiral right, between exactly. the two of them. Yeah, she gets really pissed. Of course, she got fucking basically violated by this guy. And yeah, and it's funny that the, the foreshadowing, like in my head, like I knew that like there yeah. was going to be some sketchy sexual thing that right, goes on between exactly. the two of them, and it certainly did. And I thought that was actually a, a pretty. Funny to me, it was funny. I mean, yeah. look, I'm not trying to offend anybody out there, but it was kind yeah, of funny. You, you see the movie, you see what we're talking about. Yeah, um, I don't condone that kind of behavior, but no, I still no, it was it's funny. a movie for God's sake. I mean, hey, it's, man, you it's, never know these days, People right? Are crazy, I know, I know, but anyway, I think our viewers know what the hell's going on. Yeah, um, our viewers, our listeners, our sorry listeners, about that. Yeah. Our viewers, if only, our, if, if only, only we were on TV, real studio, forget here, about yeah. it now. Um, but anyway, they get into a fight because she's pissed. And starts breaking stuff and smashing dishes and whatnot, and uh, a little, you know, a little scuffle the two of them, and a, and a large knife goes into him. Yes, that was a little bizarre, though. That, I mean, well, that's what I mean. This is when shit starts falling apart for me, really. Yeah, you know, it's like, and right around this time is when supernatural shit starts happening. Yeah, right. Like before that, a little bit. There's like a bird and mm -hmm. some fucking, you know, feather they find in the house or whatever, and like. There's some activity starting to happen. But the way the knife is like through his stomach, like, yeah. like that, that wouldn't happen if someone pushed you. Like it's just, I don't no. know, it's a little But weird. actually, one of the things I'm going to bring up right now is even through all this time, she was not really honest with him about what her objective was. No, no. And earlier in the film, there's a, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing because he's at they're sitting outside and he's asking her questions like do you speak french or whatever and she they speak french and he's like mm. what about german mm. and she says that she speaks german mm. right and then he's he's cutting he's like whittling some piece of wood and he cuts himself like subtly mm. and he's like are you lying to me do you really she's, she's like well yeah i can make myself understood in german and he's like well that's that's you don't speak german and he's like she's like i didn't cause you to cut your hand he's like everything here matters Right. Mm, Do you remember right. that? So in the later in the film, we discover that she actually that she didn't it's, share this with Joseph. It's not just that she wants to talk to her son. She wants to fucking get revenge. Oh, we, actually, we didn't right. really just get into this really. Oh, but, sorry. 
But the son was killed by occultists, these mm. teenage occultists who sacrificed him during a ritual, mm. all right? Which is kind of fucking stupid, really. Right. It's, you know. But she doesn't want to talk to her son, really. What she wants to do is get revenge on the people that killed her son. Killed her son. Mm. That's a perfectly reasonable goal to have. Right. However, she ne- did not tell him did, that. Right. All the stuff they've done was for... Right. And that's why I think he ended up getting stabbed. Mm. Is because they had a little foreshadowing when she told him a little white lie about how she doesn't really mm. speak German. So so her lies fucked him up. Yeah. Because he was the practitioner. He was the practitioner. Right. Yeah, so yeah would, okay. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's just a little thing there, I think. Because mm. you're right. It was weird how they had a scuffle with a knife and like she <laughs> he ended up getting like, stabbed right through the side. Yeah. You know? It's like you would have had to like do that to somebody. Yeah, and right, right, happened, right. Yeah. And she didn't do that to him. She didn't like look like somebody took the knife, held you, and poof, right, plunged so now, it through you. Things are going downhill for old Joseph now. Yes, things he's are getting infected. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like doesn't look too good for him. No, okay. Like around this time, she decides she wants to leave the house. Like he's in bed. He's like at this point, he's degenerated he's so like much. Dying. So he's bedridden. Yeah. He's and dying. he does die. Yeah, yeah. So she goes out of the house. She crosses the line. And there's a, they sort of, she goes the salt, to, the salt line. To get is, medical help. Yeah, to get actually. medical help. Yeah. The salt line, you can see, has been worn away. So it gives you the, the feeling that they've been there for a long time. Mm. You know, she gets, tries to go into her car and her car doesn't start. Then she's like, all right, I'm going to walk to town. So she gets out on the road, walks, but she ends up back at the back house. Back in front of the house. Yeah, that was cool. She comes back into the house and the place has been overrun by these like weird demonic little figures These, children and like yeah, yeah yeah and they they now there was some really effective shit that involved her voices and her son mm. and when she's like locking herself in the room mm-hmm. and then she, there's a voice that says that's it's a little boy's voice and she's like let me in mommy and she's right, like right. i know it's not you yeah yeah and it's like that those scenes were fucking good i thought yeah very they creepy were. very creepy they were creepy you know so now the place is lousy with fucking demons, okay? <laughs> and uh, these hands, they grab Joe, they drag him away. Now, this is like where I really fucking start despising the film a little bit. <laughs> this is where things start really going downhill for me. And I'm not saying it, I don't hate it, but it's like this is where I start losing me. The demons, um, they, they sort of subdue her, they put her in a chair, they start torturing her, they cut her finger off. Right, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, she gets away. There's this light upstairs. She follows the light, and there's this fucking an- angel, this gigantic angel. angel. I thought that was actually. I actually was impressed with the way well, that, 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 that was, was cool. Really cool. That was cool. But the thing is, is another out of sequence thing. Earlier in the film, she says something of like, "I don't do forgiveness." She doesn't forgive. She says those right? words right. So the angel was like, she's like, oh, I for, you know, she's in front in the in the presence of the angel, and he whispers something to her, and mm-hmm. she's like, oh, I forgive, I forgive, everyone. I forgive, I forgive, yeah. I forgive, I forgive, and then everything's cool, all right. Now, <laughs> the, 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 that's the weird thing. Like, so did what happened to her with those demons or creatures? Did that not really happen? Like, did I don't like? I, well, did, clearly it happened because at the end of the film, when the short driving away, she's missing a hand. She a miss, oh, she is. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So that's right. this is where it falls apart to me because it's like a fucking morality play at the end of the day. It is actually pro Christian. It's yeah, but I don't know if that was the intent or maybe it wasn't. Um, well, let's put it this way: in the UK, it's very Christian. You're either ca- he actually well, asks in her, Ireland. Are you are you well? Are all he all goes. Of, are you Catholic? He's already Catholic. It's ca- yeah, maybe. You know, wow, it's maybe. like this. This there's like a or specifically in Ireland. It's a they want to know what you are Roman Catholic. It's a Roman Catholic country. Well, the and there was there's certainly Protestants. So there, they were killing I mean, each like, other for years. Yeah, that Catholic was the conflict, right? Right. But there's a lot of most you know a lot of mostly, Irish people are, are Catholics, right? Mostly it's Catholic. Yeah, but there's Protestants. But as well. there's also Protestants there. But it's like. So they're, that's, they're, you're either one or the other. Mm-hmm. There aren't too many Jews. You know, it's no, like, no. It's, it is what it is there. Nope. So that's why I believe that this was like a, a morality play mm. over like, you know, turn the other cheek. About forgiveness. Yes. About, forgiveness About forgiveness. And, mm. and like, 
the torture of holding on to these like this these vengeful thoughts and not forgiving somebody because she went through hell. She was suffering in life. Okay, now and these these the creatures were that, literally like <laughs> torturing her. The only thing about that is an innocent man had to die for that. Well, yeah, but that was through. Once again, my theory is that she fucking lied. She was lying. She caused his death. She caused his death. She did cause his through, death. Through lying. Right. And, or, or like not even really lying, but like not telling the whole truth. Right. And so, so this guy got, you know, he died. So the angel gave her a chance at redemption after all that shit happened? Well, that's and the Christian way, right? That is true. That's like, you know, no, you, no, and, I were, you and I were both raised Catholic. I was Catholics, raised Catholic. So that is a Christian way. how it is. That is Christian way. You, you go in but and you boy, make confession. she got off easy. <laughs> well, not that easy. She, she lost, got, lost a finger. Yeah. And <laughs> she also was like gone through in pretty intense travail, like going through the, the whole shit with the demons right. and everything. So um, actually, th- there... Th- Parts of this movie are very cool and different and and interesting. Uh, I would say, you know, when we when we break it down like that, yeah. um, it's it's not the typical horror movie, ghost movie. I mean, it's it's ghost movie, but like it's got a lot more going on in this whole re- religious kind of sense. You yeah, know, definitely. Um, wasn't very scary. I mean, it, it, to a degree, maybe a little bit with some of those those demonic creatures were a little scary well yeah um but in a way it's almost like a better made film than devil's candy in a way oh no i i like this better than devil's candy Mm. definitely i um i i only have a problem with the really heavy hand immorality play being forced down my my throat because i the well it was the story i mean it wasn't necessarily so forced down do you think it was forced down well what i wanted to see the movie i wanted to see was some fucking creepy occult shit you know, about getting fucking, revenge, maybe, or about or, or about vengeance. I don't or even about, care about that. I'm caring about like like that. I wanted to see some fucking rituals. I wanted to see like mm. some devils. I wanted to see right. s- satanic <laughs> shit. You know, I wanted to see some fucking otherworldly conjurings. You know, this had more of a a a quiet elegance to it, though. Maybe not elegance, but it had more of a quiet mood. Yeah. to it. But the the fact that. It was real claustrophobic too, with the two of them just locked in the house. And I yeah. thought that was effective. I thought that the weird psychological shit going on between the two of them was good. And when a, like weird stuff started happening, like when her son's voice happened, that was good. Hmm. You know. And then, but but they, I didn't need the Christian shit. You know what I mean? Well, the angel looked cool. Yeah, I thought it looked cool. I was like, what the hell? All but right, I just wow. didn't need. I didn't need the heavy handedness of the ending. You know, hmm. oh, all you gotta do is forgive everyone, and like your fucking, all your demons are gonna go. Literally, your demons are gonna fucking mm. leave you. Mm. To me, it was like too like too on the nose for me. Yeah, you yeah. know, I, I I I I hear you on that. Yeah, I hear you. Well, it's funny as as far as what I would would rate this. Like, I'm I'm thinking about a three. Yeah, I was gonna give it a three because like I said, I said all these negative things about it, but I'm still probably gonna watch it again. Yeah, now I kind of want to check it out again, yeah. after based on some of the things you said and mm-hmm. what we've uh, uncovered. Um, it's it's different. It's it's yeah. slow. It's, it's very slow, slow which That's is cool thing, though. Man. It's really slow, but there are some interesting scenes in it, and the performances are pretty good. I mean, you know, I almost feel like three is isn't enough, but like I wasn't like love in love with it or anything, you know. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's worth it's worth seeing. It's worth seeing. You know, like I, I, I really expected there to be more like demonology and like dark shit like that in there, and it really, really wasn't. Mm. You know, and it's like because it builds you up to that. Like the, the artwork for the movie is like a big pentagram and like mm. candles and shit like that, and you're thinking like, okay, there might be some like some dark witch stuff going on here. That's you know, kind of black what I magic too. going on. You know, a like, dark song. Yeah, That's or maybe the title. Though, maybe like, this dude is like. A chaos magician or something and like you know trying to say that that was where my mindset was when i first started watching the movie and then it turned into this christian like you know morality thing and mm, i was just like yeah. oh yeah forgive everyone it's like well it's, yeah sure but like <laughs> i don't need to like watch a horror movie to learn things like that you know that's true that's true so imagine if they there's, there's this new a new wave of christian horror movies i was 
I bet you there's somewhere out there. Oh yeah. Well, well, even like The Conjuring has like a slight Christian. It thing yeah, kind of. I I enjoy those movies though. Come no, on too. I, I I did. I like them too. But you know, you, you got to give respect where respect is due. You the gotta, thing like, is the the the, 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 the the ghost hunters, uh, the husband and wife, they are Christian. So it may, I mean that that is what they that, that's what they were and that's what they are. So it's like that does play into it. So you know. In real life, that they were. You know, in Preacher, in the comic books, and in the TV show, they refer to God, and, you know, there's all sorts of Christians. Yeah, Jesse wants God to be okay. Yeah. He's looking for God mm-hmm. because he wants, he does. He thinks God shouldn't be taking a vacation. Like, yeah. So Actually, even, have you, are you caught up with? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, great. Very right? good. Second season kills. Yeah. It was great. It was really cool. And you read the comics when they were back in the 90s, Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I own every question. single issue. Yeah. yeah, man. I was reading as it was happening. Yeah, me too. I loved it. Uh, that was one of my. I couldn't wait for those issues to come out. Yeah, man. I'm fortunate in that. I, back then, I was reading that as it happened. I read the last three years of Sandman as it happened. Yeah. I, I missed the first few and jumped in around the midpoint of Sandman. Um, you know, man, do I wish I had some of those Walking Dead's that you had? Well, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> You were sold. in on day one of yeah. Walking Dead, yes. I sold. On I have almost my whole se- my whole series. The whole thing is almost gone. I yeah. have like the last say thirty or forty issues left to sell. Mm. So yeah, anyone out there, if you uh, <laughs> hit me up through the Necro Facebook, if you want to buy like issue like one twenty to whatever, mm. you know, like I still have a bunch of those around. But all the everything pre one hundred is gone right wow, now. Wow, that's wild. But as you as you see, I have all the compendiums here. Yeah, well, that's that's going to be coming back soon. Yeah, looking forward to that. But then I hear Robert Kirkman is suing AMC. That can't be good. So uh, hmm. about money. Ah, know. it's always about money, man. Yeah, it's always about money. And he just signed a deal with Amazon or for his future stuff or Netflix no. or or another one one of the other you know people out there Dude, for his future stuff. It's like we were saying, man. That's the new TV. The new TV is the internet. It's like, yeah, it's not going to be like. Tune in at like nine o'clock anymore. It's like tune in when you want. Like it's going to be up. Yeah, well, I, I'm down to uh, no network shows. I'm not. I don't watch a single show on ABC, NBC, Fox, or uh, CBS. Nothing. No, no, hmm. I don't. The only thing that oh, and I watched this after the fact was Hannibal. That was on. Uh, channel, yeah. that was on NBC for a while. See, and that's not on because we liked it and it was good. So they have to get rid of that. It was good. Well, and, be, and we like it. I mean, it's the wrong demographic. If I that know. movie start, if that show started on AMC or something like that, or FX, oh, no, it would be, or if it, it was even on like you know HBO or or fucking mm-hmm. even an Amazon show, it'd be massive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of HBO, we'll say a little quick uh, something about the Deuce. Uh, it premiered uh, this Sunday. Um, I'd seen it like two or three weeks ago, actually, and uh, I really, I really liked it. And I liked how it ended with a real sleazy ending. Uh, with the, uh, the 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 prostitute who got like kind of cut up uh, in the end. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I, that was actually a, a, kind of a surprise, actually, because as I was watching it, I was like, "Hmm, okay." They just you know they're kind of focusing more on the drama side here, nothing too over the top. And it's like, "Oh, okay, here it comes." So yeah, I thought that was actually really cool. Um, I think it's it's so people would throw, "Oh, it's like vinyl again." It's nothing like Hell vinyl. No. Nothing like it. Hell no. It's way more subtle. Dude. It's it's better. It's better acted, um, and it looks better. Also, the people writing it are, yeah. are like, you know, look. I said this. I love Martin Scorsese, but his medium is crime. Yeah, crime fiction, crime mm-hmm. stories about the mafia. Yeah, he's make, got that new one, The Irishman coming. Yeah, out. that's I bet that's gonna be great. It's be fucking amazing. This this sh- this uh, the Deuce had Richard Price is involved in writing it. The, all and. The, um, well, the, the guy from the wire. Uh, yeah, the guy from the wire. It, it, it's uh, the thing is, it's just I like the fact that it's not this loud, obnoxious portrayal of like 1971. It's a very kind of like a subtle, moody portrayal of 1971, sure. and I would say it might even be more accurate. And the way they make like uh, they filmed the Washington Heights. Mm-hmm. That looks oh, that looks really good, yeah. man. I mean. That looks like Times Square. I mean, I think it looks beautiful. Oh, no, and the attention to detail with all of the, even the prices of like a pizza. A yeah, no, a and I just, I think it. I mean, the movies that were to be shown on on on. Yeah, the the, the bird of crystal plumage on the on the marquee. I thought that was so awesome. Yeah. I was like, that's Dario's first movie in America, nineteen seventy one. Um, 
I just, I mean, I really dig it. And uh, the characters seem cool. The acting is, I like, Top you know, notch, the performances. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see where it goes. I mean, I know the idea uh, for it, I, I read in an interview, um, was that they, they want at least three seasons to tell a story that starts in 71 and ends around 85. They had and, that thing uh, in the Rialto Report, mm-hmm. which, yep, yep. which I listened to. Yeah. And that's, that's a great podcast, by the way. Oh, yeah. I went out there, I was into checking out. Hello, Ashley West. Yeah. Fucking awesome podcast, Rialto Report. Um, yeah, they, they'll, they'll tell you uh, a lot more uh, about it. And uh, I hope they do make it that far because, man, because that's when things were... I mean, 71, it was, it was, it was kind of the be almost like the real kickoff of the sleaze yeah. it was prostitutes and stuff but like the the rampant violence and drug use and the aids by 85 oh my, it was just ooh, you know and uh i'm looking forward to kind of seeing if that could you know will get portrayed yeah definitely man and once again the rialto report too it's like if you're um it's a great podcast if you're um interested at all in like exploitation and this kind of sleaze porno early adult early stuff. adult mm-hmm. films um it's a very, very interesting, very uh, journalistic yes. um, analysis mm-hmm. with interviews and very, very detailed um, explorations he, of that whole he, he genre. Treats it, he, uh, he treats it the way, I mean, uh, you, you know, movies like to, a top-notch, go- The Godfather would be treated on another podcast, basically, yeah. is the way he kind of treats that kind of cinema. And I think it's great because it's very authentic and he knows his shit, like- really knows his shit yeah you know and he and has and really stories, great interviews mm-hmm. i mean and it's like the background stories are really what it's all about it's mm. like it's really i mean you know interesting insights into the people the filmmakers lives and some of the actors like it's got the dark brothers like it's yep, the dark yep. brothers like episode <laughs> yeah uh one of the one of the best ones uh i thought was about uh, the, uh, the uh it was he was a gay porn star dennis parker um who, you know, was in all straight movies, you know what I'm saying? And his whole backstory about him and, like, he had a, a, a hit disco song and it was just this great. Then he went on to be on the soap opera later on in the 80s and then he, you know, sadly died of AIDS at a young age. And it's just like this, he just gets all this information and just kind of puts it together, like, so well, you know? I think it's great. So that, that's it, man. Another great episode, another fun, yes. action-packed episode. 23 is... Uh, in the, in the can, as they say, yeah. and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be back. We're on we're on a monthly roll, everybody. So we will have a Halloween uh, podcast for October. Oh yeah, man, we gotta make. We this, have to think of something cool for that. We're gonna make this really <laughs> something special. We have to make it a good one. Yeah. Not that they're all not good ones, right? They're all great. But Halloween being, you know, what it is. Yeah. And this being the type of podcast it is, it makes sense that we put a little extra. We have to put a little extra care. To the you know, a little one. extra special something into that one. Cool. All right. Thank you all once again so much for the support. Check us out on Instagram and on Facebook and our uh, Patreon as well. And uh, we will see you all next time. Another